there was one thing I wanted to show you over here as we're approaching the bow. See all these shavings down here? And even more so up here. Uh, that's planar shavings, and I'm having to do that more and more as I get closer to the bow here. And here's a good example of it. I don't know if you can see this or not, but uh, see where there's a plank above is canted out just a little bit. And you can see how I've got all those planed down to a nice smooth plane. Um, but you're getting more of this as we get towards the bow here. Um, you're getting these little steps in here and I'm planing all this down. And I'm sure a lot of that is just simply because of the twist you get as you're coming back up towards the bow here. It curves in a little more. And then it, uh, it twists a little bit too, so that makes it difficult to, for these boards to lay flat against each other. They kind of step. So I'm having to plane all that down, uh, which isn't too bad using a power, power hand plane, but still it's, it's uh, taking a little longer. And then you want to sand it after you've planed it too. I run 40 grit sandpaper on my little five inch random orbital. And the reason for that is when you plane it, it leaves an awfully smooth surface, a very almost shiny surface if you've got a, a fresh planer blade in there anyway. And the epoxy isn't going to adhere as well to that. So I make sure after I've planed it to hit it with the sander as well, which I'm sanding all of these areas down anyway but uh, or for the most part but you really want to make sure if you've planed something to to roughen the surface up with some coarse sandpaper so the epoxy has a has a good grip on it so I'm in the engine room now and uh, something else I wanted to point out something that I've been contemplating um, how to treat the bilge here now, I was planning on just coating it with the, the copper naphthenate like I've been doing everything else, which may well be what I, what I end up doing here too, I don't know. But a concern I had, originally I had wanted to put a, a tray under the engine, a drip tray to catch any, any leaks the, engines, the engine or transmission may produce, oil leaks, whatever. Uh, but the thing is, it's not really too practical. I mean, I couldn't really do it <clears throat> earlier, and now it's, I don't know. Um, it would have be, been difficult to get something to fit under there and, and then have it actually catch anything and then actually be able to drain it or, or service it was going to be a problem. So I thought, well, maybe I could just like stretch a tarp underneath there and then and then put some of those pig blankets on that tarp, which I think that would probably work as well as anything that would prevent any minor leaks from from dripping down into the bilge one of the worries or concerns i had was you know a bilge pump here and you really kind of need a bilge pump in this area of the bilge this is the most likely area for water to come in so you really kind of want a bilge pump here but you don't want to be pumping oil or fuel leaks or anything like that out of the boat into the ocean or lake or whatever your body of water you're on so I was contemplating that, and I wasn't sure what if there was regulations resulting in that. I, I, most of the boats I've seen have just bilge pumps in, in this area, in the engine area, and, and I, I don't see it as a concern. That said, though, I wasn't entirely certain. Um, so I got my books out, broke my books out, and, and I think it was David Gare mentioned, or maybe it was... I don't know, one of the books I've got anyway, he talked about it a little bit and uh, and said that the EPA or whoever it was, was in 2015 anyway, they were looking at that, whether restricting, you know, pumping out bilge water, having a, an oil filter or catch system um, ahead of the discharge. So I don't know. And he said they were looking at it, but nothing had done. And I haven't heard anything to the contrary to that. So I don't think they've done anything with that. I can't imagine that would be a huge um, contamination problem, considering all the things that are contamination issues in the world today. And I can't imagine boat pumping bilges would be that big a deal. But um, I got to thinking about that. And if I have to, I could turn this pump off. Um, I could switch it 
independently of the rest of the bilge pump so it wasn't automatic um, and, and leave my my float switch there that's hooked up to an alarm or will be hooked up to an alarm I could have that independent and then if it goes off you could come down take a look and see what's going on if, if it's water coming in then you, then you could switch this bilge pump on and just leave it off normally of course that's kind of a risky proposition too then isn't it um, I suppose if you're uh, anchored somewhere or off the boat or whatever you could turn the switch on because then you shouldn't really have anything leaking into the bilge any major oil or fuel leaks in, into the bilge while you're just sitting there but you never know that either so I don't know um, but I think I'm going to leave it as is for now and just you know we'll probably hook it up as automatic and if you know they change those laws or something then we can always if they would change those laws or something we can always always switch again then but uh yeah so i'm debating what to do here on the floor in here um it would be easier to clean the bilge if i had it you know sealed up and, and, and painted with bilge paint but that's kind of a pain to get down in there now and and do all that too i i don't know i don't know if it would make much of a difference i guess if the rest of the bilge is just painted in in the copper naphthenate there's really no particularly good reason to, to do this any differently yeah other than like i said it'd be easier to clean it if it was actually painted but but if i have a dry engine and clean engine room and you know there shouldn't be a whole lot of issues regardless but but anyway that's just something i've been contemplating what to do down here it looks like i got the floorboards torn up so yeah we'll see how that goes so in last week's video i uh was speculating on the the problem i was having with my epoxy the crystallization or flakes that were forming in it and i asked you guys for any opinions you had and uh, appreciate the re responses and several of you thought that maybe it was uh crystallization of the, of the resin and uh that's yeah that's a viable you know possibility but in this case i don't think that's what was happening um first of all i'm careful with with my epoxy I specifically do not order it in the winter time and epoxy crystallizes generally from cold temperatures and I don't order my epoxy in the winter time I only order it in the, in the warmer months uh, specifically for that reason so we, we don't get crystallization um, the other thing is I keep it in a temperature controlled you know 68 degrees in here in nice dark stored well you know at, at 68 degrees and um, so I seriously doubt if the storage, you know, would be an issue here. The other thing is, I had some of this epoxy left over from the first my first boat that I built, that 20-footer. And uh, I had like a gallon and a half left over. And that's the first stuff that I started using on this boat. And it sat in my garage for four years. And now I do keep heat in there so it doesn't freeze, but it's 45 degrees. So if this epoxy was ever going to crystallize, I mean, it would have happened in that four years that it was sitting in that in that garage at, in the wintertime at least at 45 degrees. And it was absolutely fine. So, and I've never had this stuff crystallize. Years and years ago, I, I have had uh, an epoxy that crystallized. But uh, this stuff has never done it. Um, like I said, I'm careful with how I store it. I'm careful with, with uh, you know, when it's shipped, that it's not cold weather when it's shipped even. So I don't think crystallization was the problem. So what do I think the problem was? Well, if you remember looking at that video um, last week, I showed the, the pump when I pulled it out of one of these jugs. And it was only one pump, but it had, uh, you know, the flakes and the white stuff all over it. Well, I suspect what happened was somewhere along the line, and I don't know how this could have happened, but I suspect somewhere along the line, I pulled a hardener pump and put it into a, a resin bottle. Sounds kind of logical, doesn't it? Why that pump would be all messed up. And it was only the one pump. Now, I had flakes in two different bottles, but remember, I switched those pumps around because I was thinking maybe I had a, a jug that was bad. Um, and actually, what I wound up doing was then transferring the, the hardened material, the 
in, into a new jug, and so I wound up having two jugs with some flakes in it. So I think that's what happened. How it happened, I don't know, but it makes sense. Uh, looking at the way that thing was, where the, the hardened material was, it was all on the pump on the outer surface, inside surfaces of the pump, then even up there in, in the piston area um, that where it uh, you know actually pumps from, you could see a, a fairly large amount of, of hardened material in there. So that's my guess. Some way, somehow, I got a pump that, I put in the wrong container. Uh, that's my guess. I, I don't know how that could have happened. It do doesn't seem real likely either, but looking at the evidence, that's about the only thing that I could really, really come up with that uh, that made any sense to me. Um, and I have had no problems since then. I've been using the new epoxy on, on the sheets of plywood, and I've been using the, the stuff, the jugs that have flakes in them that just simply fell off the and they aren't that bad. There isn't much in there. Um, so I probably could use these. But I've just been using these for thickened epoxy when I need thickened epoxy. And I actually haven't been using the pumps at all anymore. I've got three different sizes of graduated containers, uh, mixing containers. So I really, really don't need the pumps that bad anyway. I mean, the, the smallest containers... Um, eight ounce containers you know you, if you need a small amount that's a, that that'll mix a, a pretty small amount even these these uh these uh, pint containers uh, the smallest graduations the number one marks on those uh, mixes four ounces so that would probably be two ounces there boy that's about as, as little as you'd ever need i would think and that's significantly less than you can mix with the pumps because with the pumps they're about one ounce per pump and you got to do a three to one ratio so that's three pumps of resin to one pump that's four ounces so four ounces this is the minimum amount you can mix using the pumps and if you're doing any more than that actually it's easier just to use the mixing containers anyway so yeah so we're carrying on, on here um yeah i'll do a finish doing my, my full update a little bit later but uh, that's the situation on the epoxy and uh, just a simple case of i think user error I think I just inadvertently put the wrong pump in the wrong container. Like I said, don't know how, but I think that's what happened. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the boat shop. And uh, today is, well, now wait, maybe I shouldn't tell you the date. Simon seemed to think it was really humorous that some YouTubers give the date when they're, when they're shooting the video. Not exactly sure why he thought that was so funny, but... He was entirely amused by that. I don't know. I always thought it was kind of a good idea to let people know, you know, when the video is being shot. Since YouTube doesn't actually put the date that the video was published, nor do most people tell you when the, the video was actually shot. So, I, I don't know. You know, some people are so far behind it. it it's. It, I think it's nice to, to let people know when, when the video was shot. Anyway, today is the 24th of April of 2024, um, even though Simon thinks that's really funny that I do that. But anyway, um, just a quick update on the rest of what's been going on. Um, I continue on with the plywood. And uh, as expected, my, my portholes came in. Like I said, they aren't really huge portholes, but um, I didn't want to go nuts up there and... You know, especially considering I had to recess them so deeply into the into the hull to get them to work, I didn't want to go nuts with big, you know, portholes or port lights. Uh, and then, of course, they're in the side of the boat too, as opposed to, you know, up on a like a house top. Uh, but these are rated A1. You know, they can be open ocean. They can be installed in the hull. So, so yeah, that's all good. <clears throat> but I got four of them. And uh, we continue on with the plywood on the sides here. And uh, yeah, you can see I got another piece on here. So I got a, a little bit shorter one that I had showed you up there that's going on here next. It's about six feet. And then there's about a four or five footer that, that goes in at the bow there. And that will complete this first row. So yeah, shortly here we'll, we'll have that first row done. And then I'll probably work I don't know, maybe I can do both at once, working at the top and then starting to fill in some of these along the bottom here too. Uh, get that done and 
And then the part that I'm not looking forward to is down here. And the good news is that if I get this top stuff done here fairly early this summer or spring or summer yet, uh, it's not going to be so miserable hot working up there. I'll be working down here, which which will help. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, things are going all right. Uh, things are progressing on schedule. I don't have any real, real issues to report. Don't have any real big news to report today either uh, but uh, I did get some more trimming done on the on the raised chair up there this piece laying down here on the ground um, is the last piece of the raised shear that I trimmed off up up to the stem there so that's uh, that's ready to go I also did a little more work inside in the engine room there I did decide to go ahead and just put uh, the green uh, copper naphthenate on the on the bilge in there on the bottom. Uh, yeah, if if for some reason down the road I decide I, I want that epoxied and painted, um, I can always do that. But uh, yeah, for now we're just gonna we're just gonna copper naphthenate it because that's the way the rest of the boat is done, and, and that's what George George kind of specified. Is the best way to do it. So, anyway, um, I will leave it at that, and uh, we'll talk to you again. Oh, yeah. Here's the one other thing. This is the battery box cover that I've been working on. Um, you can see that's the glass I laid up, and I made a little wood frame. And then I'm gonna route these corners down, round them all over, and then I'll put some fiberglass over the top, and, and then over the edges here. Then we'll coat everything real well in epoxy and then put some sort of a seal in there so we got our battery box sealed up. But we'll leave it at that for today.